Okay, so welcome to the last colloquium of the semester, I think. It will be given by Oleg Pichulko from Warwick University, uh, who is now visiting IMA for three weeks, so we had a chance to steal him for one day. And he will be speaking about measurable circle squaring. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time. You have a nice campus. So today I'm going to talk about basic problem you can ask about the sets. You have the set A and B. And the question is, can you split A in two parts and rearrange to form B? And pretty much uh, many results were known. And in this talk, we will try to show that some things you can do in a measurable way. So namely, uh, in particular, somehow you can circumvent axiom of choice and get measurable pieces. And this is this joint work with Lukas Grabowski and Andrew Schmatte. So Lukas has a background in group theory, and Andrew is an analyst. And I come from uh, combinatorics. Hopefully, we'll reach combinatorial part of the talk at some point. Uh, we'll see. So maybe let me start with definition, uh, which is the main one. So I have uh, two sets, and suppose the leaf inside are k. Standard k dimensional real space. And now I say that it will be composable. And I might write it as A uh, similar to B. Exactly is if the following holds. If I can split A into parts, if there exists a partition, or maybe I'll just say partition of A and B into the same number of parts. We require that corresponding parts are congruent, which means I can find a isometry of Rn, map which keeps preserves distances, and map each AI into BI, into BI such that uh, AI and uh, BI are congruent. For every index i. Ah, please do interrupt if you have any questions yeah. at any point of your clarification. So this is the definition. Again, it says I can split A into parts, rigidly move them, and get copy of B. And here mm -hmm. is an example. Actually, in this area, it's very difficult to draw examples. <laughs> here is an example which is easy to draw, but it's not exactly this definition. So. Like, so pay attention uh, so to while this fails. Just rotations and translations, or do you allow other At the moment, these are isometries, so I allow rotations as well. Mm -hmm. In one of the results, uh, we will look only at translations. So can you like, flip it? Or, I mean, uh, here, all results, actually, uh, you can restrict to orientation preserving isometries as well. So if you have some method, usually you don't need to flip uh, pieces. So here is an example. Well, I put it a kind of example. As uh, which many of us saw in uh, from elementary geometry course, when you compute area of uh, triangle, so what you can do, you can uh, draw a line parallel to base at height one half, and then cut it like this. And then now, if I draw base again. Then this piece uh, fits exactly here, and this one uh, fits perfectly here. So we, instead of a uh, triangle, we can make a rectangle. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, three pieces. And of this rotated like this, the other one that way. But it's not quite an example. Mm -hmm. What's wrong here? Yeah, boundary. boundary, because somehow. For example, maybe if you look at this, suppose the closed figures is a boundary, but then these two points are mapped uh, into the same point. 
So what you have here is called a dissection congruent, uh, which means pieces are polygons in R2, and you ignore boundaries. So that's kind of uh, congruent, which you probably, if you play it with games like Tangram or Pentamine, or you know how it works. Yeah, but uh, in fact, uh, and then, so known theorem is by Wallace Gavin Bolley from 19th century that uh, if you take any two polygons in R2 of the same area, then they are intersection congruent. And you can do thing, make one into another using polygonal pieces. And then uh, later, uh, Banach and Tarski, in their famous paper, they brought many results. So let me just take one of them to start there. They show that, in fact, in this uh, Wallace-Gervin Wallace results, you can uh, fix boundary as well. So uh, this is a composition you can make into equity composition. So, so in particular, for every two uh, uh, polygons, P1 and P2, which live in R2, of same area, uh, they are congruent, uh, they are actually composable. So it's not a trivial result, but uh, it's not difficult. But main result in their paper was if you go to dimension three and higher, then actually you can do almost everything. So uh, the main result is the following. paper. So it says if you are uh, in dimensions 3 or higher and you take any two boundary sets and only you require that you have an empty interior, mm -hmm. then you can uh, equally compose one into the other. So for every AD inside uh, RK where K has to be at least 3, Yes, so we live in sufficiently rich space, so two dimensions where we live all is possible, uh, such that both have non-empty interior. And both are bounded. So now if you have uh, this assumption, then the conclusion is that they are actually composable. Yeah, maybe I'll call it theorem one. So in particular, uh, you can start with one unit ball and uh, make two. So this result opens like huge practical possibilities. <laughs> you can get one orange and make two, or make hundred or whatever. Yeah. And of course, uh, the, it works because they had to use axiom of choice. So for results like this, when you change measure of a set, your pieces cannot be measurable. Because if pieces are measurable, then by additivity you cannot increase or decrease volume. Maybe some remarks about this result. Uh, or maybe just say. So uh, this restriction is necessary. So it's known that if you have such a relation in R1 or R2, you cannot change measure. So somehow uh, isometries of R3 or higher are much richer group. And idea why it works uh, basically, it goes back to Hausdorff, uh, a less known paradox of Hausdorff, which is very similar uh, to this one. It says if you look at uh, surface of sphere, let's say S2 for simplicity, then you, using rotations, 
You can make two copies of sphere. So you can cover every element twice, uh, except up to a countable set. And proof idea is uh, somewhat, uh, it's not difficult in this result uh, because you look at a group of uh, isometries, sets of three, and then it's not difficult to show that it contains a free group of round two. When you say that generator will be A and B. And now, uh, why this group is paradoxical? So here is a simple picture. So suppose you start with some point on the sphere, which is typical point. So if you apply A and A inverse, B and B inverse, so say A go up, A inverse go down, B schematically goes uh, right, B inverse left, then typically you see for different points. Only for special acts like uh, U and B, there will be only two points uh, X and the X coincide. And then you apply the uh, same thing. You, you can draw this tree. Which kind of one way how people like to write a tree group on two elements and so on. And now, why is this paradoxical or how this works? Well, if you look at, say, a set like this, so from the point of view of the center, you occupy quarter of your group, or quarter of orbit of x. We start with vertex x. But if you multiply it by a inverse, then what you get would be uh, like three quarters of your group. So if you multiply it by a inverse, so in some sense, uh, from a quarter, you can make three quarters of your group. And that's like what is the basis for these two results. This is a very hand waving and schematic way. So maybe I'd like to give some proofs uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of the talk. So I'll, this is a very nice rich area. So if you want to learn more, there is a very nice book by Stan Wagon, which I highly recommend. Uh, one of the paradox. And it has lots of results and background and history. Okay, so so, so far, uh, summary is if you look at equidecomposition relation and you are in dimension sufficiently large, you can do whatever you want, essentially. If, uh, from small p, you can make huge sums. Uh, and then question is, what about R2? And uh, here, question which starts to be asked around the same time. If in R2 you take this and square of the same area, are they actually composable or not? Oh, I think I need. So uh, basically, if I take a disk and uh, square of the same area in R2, are they equally composable or not? And this question remained open for about 65 or so years. There were some positive and negative results. For example, positive result was von Neumann showed, well, if you relax this notion, and allow a fine transformation, even uh, those which preserve volume, then the answer is yes. And in R2, then with a fine transformation, you can get any paradoxes you want in R2. And another result was in 60s that if you restrict your notion and say each piece is topologically a disk, so you don't have any holes inside, then the answer is no even if you allow to ignore boundary of your pieces. So 
And then uh, in 1990, uh, uh, Laskovich proved that the answer is yes. And uh, later he wrote two follow-up papers. And so his main result is the following. So, so this is result by Laskovich from his uh, two stronger papers, which says the following. So now dimension is arbitrary. I have uh, two sets inside RK. Uh, so I assume they are bounded. Uh, then have nice boundary. Uh, okay, let me. Uh, so and condition is that if you look at box dimension, I'm going to define in a moment, but it just says uh, of boundary of A and box dimension of boundary of B is smaller than K. Uh, and uh, one more assumption, if you have this condition, then you set a really nice, uh, automatically you'll back measurable. And if you assume that it has the same Lebesgue measure, zero, then the conclusion is that they are actually composable. And in fact, uh, more stronger, uh, here for isometries, you don't need to rotate pieces. You only uh, need to translate them. So I'll write it like this. So uh, here, we use translations only. So I'll just come in a moment to the definition. So basically it says in R2, in, in R1, if you have a two sets of one line whose boundary is not uh, too big, and they have the same measure, then uh, they are <coughs> decomposable. In fact, uh, it's enough to use translations only. And before I do this, another side remark that this condition is also necessary. So somehow it's known that if uh, you are uh, equidecomposable in R2, then you cannot change measures, even if your pieces are ugly. Or if you use translations only in any dimensions, again, you cannot change measures. So there are some results that this we cannot relax. So it's again a very uh, general theorem. So it remains to, de uh, to define what is box dimension. But uh, before I go, are there any questions? Okay, so, so what is the box dimension or the upper Minkowski dimension? Okay. There are many equivalent definitions. I give one probably which will be used more directly in the proof, which is the following. So you have some set X. Maybe it's some boundary of some figure in this case. So X is the scale. Then what you do, you let n times infinity be very large, and you draw a grid. where each side is 1 over n. Doesn't look very regular, but all these supposed to be 1 over n, the distance. And then what you do, you mark squares which intersect your set x, and just do few of them. And now, you, what would be a reasonable definition of dimension? Well, for example, if your set uh, is one-dimensional, then you would expect that the number of squares should be somehow linear in n. If it's like a surface, you would expect it to be uh, to grow like n squares. Like this. So reasonable definition is we take number of boxes that intersect x. <coughs> We take log 
So we'll see. And we, we divide by log n. So this roughly is uh, C, uh, as n to some power how number of boxes grows. And then we take uh, supremum as n links loop as n tends to infinity. And that's, yeah, and what we get is defined to be a box dimension of set x. I guess so what we do, we uh, partition whole space into small boxes, small cubes, and then we see how many of them intersect x. So roughly, or three, or take ring soup, it's n to some power alpha, and we call this alpha dimension of set. So for example, if you take uh, box dimension of a boundary of a square, uh, if you have square size uh, one by one, then you would expect one over n, box, uh, n boxes hitting every side. So it grows like n to power one, so its box dimension is one. And similar, if you look at the boundary of disk, uh, on this, uh, if you zoom in on a very small scale, it looks like straight line boundary. So again, its box dimension is one. In particular, if you uh, take this theorem, it applies to uh, disk and square. So it solves a uh, set of square and problem. How does that compare to Hausdorff's dimension? Uh, wait. Uh, Hausdorff's dimension could be smaller. And uh, actually, Laskovich, uh, in some papers, 2000 something, has example that you cannot put Hausdorff dimension in the theorem. So if you just plug here Hausdorff dimension, this result, there is a counterexample. Okay, and uh, both of these results, even here it's not so obvious, uh, both of them use axiom of choice. So pieces which you get need not be measurable. And so question uh, which remained was, uh, can we make all pieces of the back measurable? And so now when I say measurable, I will mean the back measurable. In some sense, we want to avoid use axiom of choice at least up to an offset. Well, on an offset, you can do whatever you want. And with Lukas and Andras, we could get uh, some positive answers. So here's theorem three. Uh, the answer is yes in theorem one. If you add to necessary conditions, yes, if. Uh, Sets you start with are measurable themselves. And uh, of course, now if every piece is measurable, then the back measure of the joint union is all the sum of measures. So uh, you cannot, and, and measure does not change under rotation. So you must preserve measure of sets. So necessary condition is that measure of A is equal to uh, measure of B. And then another result, which is more recent, that in theorem 2, without any further assumption, the answer is yes. Oh, that's theorem 2, and this is in theorem 1.
and this proves they share uh, some common ideas. And surprisingly, there are also combinatorics, especially in this theorem. So I'll try uh, maybe give some sketch of proof of theorem 4. And before I start, uh, are there any questions? Is the causalist necessarily true if you can find such an you know, theorem 2? Say that if A and B satisfies those conditions, especially that if the leg measures are the same, then they are uh, congru uh, they are equally composed. Yeah. Is the congruence true if they are equally composed necessarily do they have the same leg measures? In a dimension, uh, yes. so somehow it depends. So you have some group with which you act. Yes. And then it's known if your group is amenable. Yes. So in particular, either if you are inside R2, or you use translations only, then under amenable group, even if you use any pieces you want, you cannot change measures. So yes, so this is indeed necessary. Because here we use translations only. So basically, uh, from Han Banach, you can derive that you can find some finitely additive uh, measure on, F, on all subsets of R2, let's say, such that the, which is invariant under translation. And, uh, and this invariant will show that uh, uh, if you evaluate it on any decomposable set, it cannot change it. So in your definition of congruence, what sort of transformations are you allowing? So in this definition, uh, any isometries. So here we use isometries. And when I write uh, A uh, similar B uh, TR, it means translations only. Only rotation. So only translations. So uh, uh, here in this theorem, I can so move pieces, but I'm, I'm not allowed to rotate. I'll try to give a sketch of proof of theorem 4. So let me uh, recall what we proved. Maybe for simplicity and to draw a nice picture, uh, suppose we are in R2, and just suppose I look only at uh, disk and square. So suppose A is the disk. B is a square in R2 of the same volume. And now I want to uh, somehow show how to split A into pieces, uh, move them and get copy of B. So the way it works, and, and so far this proof coincides with Laskovich. So it's the same what he does. So first I choose large D, depending on my, how nice my sets A and B are. And again, to draw pictures, uh, I'll draw pictures for D equal to later. And then what we do, we pick a, a random, ah, before this, sorry, uh, one more thing is, okay, so we work inside R2, but it would be much nicer if underlying space is bounded and compact, so instead what we do, we imagine we work inside torus. Mm. So it means when I translate set, I take it modulo 1. And it doesn't really change the game because, uh, for example, I can make, I can scale my set down and make them very small. So if I can do it inside torus, I can uh, pull it back to R2. Uh, so the first assumption is we work inside torus, so i.e. we work modulo 1. And then, uh, so what I can do next, I can pick random vectors, uh, x1, xz inside torus. 
But each uniformly distributed, they're independent. And then I would need some property that typical vector can. And so I fit such set of vectors that satisfy typical properties. And finally, I choose a large uh, constant m, which will depend on previous choices. So a, b, b, and my vectors x, i. And basically, this step says for almost cho every choice of axis, there exists some m, the properties which you need. And now, here is the uh, first uh, step. So, what we say, I already tell you what translations are going to be. So, I call this set V. So what I'll be allowed to do, I would be uh, my vectors, but which I'm going to translate. Each one would be integer combination of x i, maybe n one times times x one, plus n b times n c. Ah, uh, this is torus. Sorry. So you look at one two over v two. So it's like unit square yeah. where you identify opposite sides. Right. So, but what is the measure pi two? Is it, is it a Lebesgue? It's, 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 it's a T, one. not a pi. Oh, it's a T. Yeah, yeah it's a blackboard T. So yeah. I have to figure that one out. Oh, yeah, so, right. so this is like a unit interval. Yeah. So where <coughs> kind of I do arithmetic modular one when I translate vectors. And now uh, my translations will come from the set where, uh, where each and i is an integer and absolute value of an i is at most m. So right at the moment I say, okay, here is my set and all translations which I'm going to use will come from the set. So if I succeed, then what is the number of parts? Well, clearly it's the smallest uh, number of vectors I have, which is like uh, 2m uh, plus 1 to power b. So some finitely many parts. And maybe uh, before I go on, so in his paper, Lackovich writes that his proof gives like 10 to 40 number of parts. While to, to double a ball, you need only five parts are enough. No. So somehow, yeah, this is it's not an indication of difficulty of proof, but yes. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. And the lower bound is uh, three or four, something like this, for number uh, for second squaring. Now we move towards combinatorial parts uh, in a few steps. So first, I want to reformulate uh, the matching problem. So I have already told you which vectors I'm going to use. And now uh, I want to restate it as a problem about finding a perfect matching in some infinite graph. So I define my partner graph. G. So part will be A and B. Well, I can assume they are disjoint for simplicity. And what are my edges? So what is my edge set? Well, uh, it's the following. I take all uh, pairs A, A plus B where A is in my first part, capital A, and uh, vector V comes from this set. So somehow I view it as an ordered graph, it's just convenient. So maybe here's the first picture. So here are my cycle and square, and maybe my first vector V1 looks like this. So which edges I put? Well, whenever if I start in A, 
I move by E1 and I hand in B, I put this patch. So, uh, this is by E1. So this is an edge. And so on. So basically, somehow it connects this part of a circle with this part of square. And then uh, I take next vector B2. So maybe here I'm less lucky, I cover less. So for each vector, I put less uh, lots of the joint edges. And so this is the pattern graph. And now let's see. So what I want to do, I want to partition A into parts. And I already told you that all transitions will come from B. So basically, what does it mean? Well, it means every vertex from A has to decide in which part it will lie. So, uh, so it has to decide which of the vectors it's going to use. Maybe there are a couple of vectors which, when you start here, you end in B. And on the other hand, also, you want to cover each vertex of B exactly one. So what we, if in this graph you find a perfect matching, then we have a physical composition. So let me write it here. So if there exists a perfect matching, I'll call it carry M in G. Then uh, we can conclude that A and B are translational to the composite. Again, what is going to be my partition of A? Like for each vector, I look at those elements from A, which chose this uh, vector, the uh, matching edge. Now uh, this graph has uh, finite degrees. So if I look at the vertex, well, the number of different vectors is at most mod v. And then for such graph, uh, there is a simple combinatorial condition. If it only is, uh, basically, if I take any finite number of elements from A, then it should have at least uh, so many neighbors, so vice versa. And basically, what Vaskovich does. Actually, it's much more work required. So this reduction is quite obvious. So then he will prove, check this whole condition for this graph. That if I take, say, 100 vertices here, they should have these 100 neighbors in B and vice versa. Uh, but this uses axiom of choice. So somehow we want to proceed differently. So let me do some example of operation where we kind of do algorithmically. We don't rely on axiom of choice. Suppose I, as a first attempt, uh, I just, okay, I take my first vector in V1. Just put some first vector, and then I say, okay, let everybody from A who can choose this vector V1 and end in B use this vector. So what does it mean? So corresponding part, uh, I look, uh, I take all guys in A, such that A plus V1 is in B. And then if nothing else is intersection of A, if I translate B back by the one. And now if I say this is my part number one, clearly it's measurable because it's intersection of two measurable sets. Okay, uh, so so far looks good. Then I can say A2, I can take all A in uh, A, 
Mas o meu pai lá, a pequena bebê que eu digo, tem um B, mas o meu pai é em B. But of course, I might mess it up because maybe two vertices want to go to the same, and I don't conflict with the previous choice. And uh, no conflict with uh, previous choices. And again, this is still a measurable step, so maybe let's just start writing definition. So again, what do I take? I take A intersection with B minus B2. Right? But uh, I cannot take everybody. If uh, somebody is already in A1, I, uh, this vertex already builds its match. So I have to exclude A1. And what else do I have to exclude? Well, uh, I cannot take a vertex and match it to somebody in B who already has a match from I1. So what is the set? Okay, so I start with I1. Those who are matched in B are I1 plus B1. And now I have to subtract B2. And again, so this is a measurable set. Because it's some Boolean combination of uh, translated measurable set. And I keep continuing. So in the definition of V, you choose x1, x2, xd, and fix it on once and for all. Yes, yeah, so uh, proof, yeah, uh, proof goes like this. I pick a large B. Yes. I pick, uh, I say, uh, let me pick random vectors. It's Which one means B. uniformly this uh, yeah. group? Okay. Then uh, here at this moment, I should have written some properties which I want to satisfy for future proof. And uh, to verify that random vectors satisfy this properties probability one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the set V is going to be a countable set, right? Mm -hmm. No, this is finite. This is V yeah, will be so, so a finite set. So V is going to measure zero. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's finite set. Yes. So I pick my million translations, and I tell you at this stage I'm going to use these translations only. Right. But each translations I might use on a set of positive measures. So maybe in this picture, suppose this is V1. So in this uh, case, A1 could be quite a large set. So by using one translation, I can take a big piece of A. So V is a finite set. Mm. Oh, I forgot to tell you, yeah, if in this definition you uh, relax it, and allow countably many paths, then it's not hard to do it in a greedy way, and so Banachowski observed you can do it measurably. So countable is easier somehow for the composition, because you can just pick one each new isometry which uses a bit extra of measures. Anyway, so here V is finite, and... Uh, okay, and then if you define it this way, until we get last one, uh, we get some not a perfect matching. So not everybody from A or everybody from B uh, will necessarily be matched. But we will get some matching. So this procedure, so what we get? We get a matching M. And it's not necessarily perfect. It can leave out some vertices from A and B. But it has two properties. Well, if instead of matching, I view it from a part point of view, each part is measurable. So I'll call such A M measurable. So it means IE, every corresponding part is measurable. And for example, it has nice property that this matching M is maximal. 
with respect to inclusion. Means when you were construction, the AIs are necessarily disjoint. Yeah, they are disjoint. They are a subset of A. But luckily, we don't know if they cover for A. But for example, uh, you can get easily property that this matching is maximal. So what I mean? Let me make a draw picture here. So it means uh, if I have some matching, I cannot add any extra edge. Why I cannot add? Well, the, well this extra edge is translation by some the I. But at stage when I was defining AI, everybody who could be added with this vector VI was added. So, so why this edge is not in M? Because it conflicts with some previous edge. And in particular, I cannot add it to my matching MI, to my matching M. Okay, but such matchings are not good. That's a bad example, for example. If you, some part of your graph looks like this, and you choose your matching to use this edge, then it's bad for you, because really you would have done better by picking these two edges. So uh, in the remaining, uh, okay, three minutes, uh, uh, I have to present like two sides of the paper. <laughs> So briefly, what we want to do, so we want to keep things measurable. So in some sense, you want to define them by simple rules. So what does it mean simple rules? So like vertex here has to decide what to do. And like in definition of A1, you tell it, uh, okay, uh, starting with yourself, move by vector V1. If you end in B, then uh, this is your edge. And then you can, if you do some similar rules, maybe more complicated. When you look at larger neighborhood, then uh, you can argue you always get measurable parts. So somehow each vertex can move around using xi. It sees picture in maybe its radius at most 1,000 and makes some decision. So this will keep you measurable. Now, to deal with problems like this, well, here we made uh, wrong choices in the first step. So what you try to do, like if you see such picture in your graph, you try to revive your matching. So you would you'd like to improve it like this. And this is again some could be done by local rule because you can say every vertex, if you see three vectors in a picture like this, you please flip yourself. And so what we do this way, so you start with this matching, maybe I'll call it M1, like first attempt. Then attempt two, you try to rewire all such small pieces. So you will get matching M2. And then attempt three, uh, if you see pieces like this, uh, let's one more edge. And uh, you made wrong choices this way. Again, you try to rewire it. Instead, you try to pick, pick the edges. So what we get is a sequence of matchings. So each one is in some sense better than previous one, hopefully. And now what we would like to define the final matching, we want to define uh, some limit of this M1, M2, and so on. And the obvious idea is to say, what is the limit? Well, if I look at vertex, different matchings may be done from different neighbors. But if from some moment they tell him the same neighbor, that's my neighbor. And so what you want to do, you want to argue that uh, set of vertices which don't stabilize eventually has small measure zero. And for this, you use Borel Cantelli. Somehow, you want to say that when you increment from mi equal to next one, you change only a very small fraction of your graph. And now, this is some combinatorics where you have to devise some good rule how to pass the next matching, plus to analyze why it does, why if you 
go to next step. Uh, every time you fix style practices, you don't change much of your graph. So somehow, uh, combinatorially, basically, you have some infinite graphs. And roughly speaking, if you have two vertices which are not matched, then there should be some relatively short rewiring which does the job. And uh, that's like most uh, what paper is about. Uh, so maybe I'll stop here. Yeah, and if you want to hear more detail here, yeah, I'll be happy to talk after colloquium. Uh, thank you. Question? This M, this large M over here, makes me think of regularity law. Is that somehow the type of M, the type of size of that M that you're getting? Uh, yes, so, uh, so uh, Laskovich, he gets uh, like uh, 10 to 40 pieces. And uh, in fact, if you just look in particular case, uh, this square to square, in this proof, it's enough to take D equal to. If you, have, you can estimate carefully, so here M is not so large. It's like whatever, 10 to power 20. So it's not really a huge M. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's very good that you mention regularity, because why do we need this large M? Or maybe a better, uh, why do we pick random choices x1, xd? What, what property we want? Uh, somehow, what property you want? So if you start with arbitrary vertex u, right, you can uh, travel using vectors x i. So you can go by x1, this is maybe by x2, and so on. And here is one of your sets, maybe a uh, circle. So what you can do, you can record when you hit, in, when you, when you sum is inside i, so here is not, here is not, here is inside. So what you get is some subset of integers. So this would be inside uh, that D. Some kind of version of A inside D, namely uh, one which you see from vertex U. And for random, if you choose this vector carefully, then this version would be very uniformly spread. So for example, if measure of A is, say, is one quarter of measure of torus, Somehow you would expect quarter of uh, density of red dots to be one quarter inside plane. And in fact, uh, with careful choices of constants, it will have property that will be very uniformly distributed. If you take a big chunk of plane, you would see very close to one quarter of point uh, from the set. And this is what uh, really is needed for the proof. And it was actually quite a trivial part in last which is how to prove it. So we had to use uh, some uh, uh, average Coxman equality and some exponential estimates. And we luckily could just type this result, so it was uh, easy for us to start. So the Banakarski one used this axiom of choice, but these other results, do they use the axiom of choice also? Okay, uh, good question. So a Laskovich result uses axiom of choice. Uh, uh, somehow uh, you, he checks false condition. It says perfect matching exists, and then now it's axiom of choice. Mm -hmm. some so how does it come about, right, roughly? Like, Sorry? What is that, at what point, how do they invoke the axiom of choice? Okay, so maybe... Uh, like it's easy to explain. Yes, yeah, so axiom of choice... Uh, uh, maybe, uh, it comes, uh, so, so you look at perfect matching in, in some infinite graph G, and then for finite graph there are this uh, equivalence if and only if uh, for every set in one part, uh, number of neighbors in the other part of X is at least mod X. So for finite graph, it holds Koenig theorem. Clearly, it's necessary condition, because if you have perfect matching, then every five vertices should have these five neighbors. So it also suffices. Now, if you have infinite graph, 
but you know that every uh, degree is finite. So every vertex has only finitely many neighbors. Then this theorem is still true. But now it uses axiom of choice. The easiest proof is by uh, some kind of compactness principle. So you know you can uh, every finite part of your graph, you can find the perfect matching. Mm -hmm. And so if you exhaust your graph and uh, you allow to use compactness, you can find uh, mm -hmm. uh, matching in the whole graph. So, uh, and now if we are not allowed to use uh, full axiom of choice, so what we get in this theorem, it will be uh, here, uh, that A and B, except we remove some null set, are equally composable with borrowed pieces. So that's uh, what we get. Namely that if you allow to remove a null set from A and B, then without axiom of choice, you can answer yes. Question. Thank you.